Welcome to Stories of Freedom, a podcast about discovering and embracing who you are in Christ. On each episode, you'll hear from people who have overcome obstacles, gained freedom, and found abundant life. Then we'll look back at each interview through a biblical lens and figure out what could apply to your life and your story, because knowing your identity changes everything. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to share these stories and biblical principles. Every believer needs to know who they are in Christ, how to fight the battle for the mind, and how to walk by faith in repentance. Stories of Freedom is a production of Freedom in Christ Ministries. I'm Dan Stute, President of Freedom in Christ USA. And I'm Abby Batson, your co-host. We're joined today by Sarah Davidar. She's a wife, mom, and a leader at her church. Sarah grew up in a Christian home in India and made a personal decision to follow Christ in middle school. From a young age, she loved to share about Jesus with other people, but her faith soon became wrapped up in what she was doing for God. She started to believe that she had to work hard for God to be pleased with her. So in our culture in India, we whatever we did, we had to do it at a really high level. Uh, for example, even education, right? It's so important. Um, and that kind of translated into almost every area of my life. So I put a lot of pressure on myself that way. And uh, I equated my worth to what I did. Sarah continued to struggle with finding her identity and her performance and seeking other people's approval into her adult life. But then someone gave her and her husband a devotional written by our founder, Neil Anderson. As Sarah read this book and a few others by Dr. Anderson, she learned about her identity in Christ and that God's acceptance of her was not based on her performance. These biblical truths had such a huge impact on her life that she's been sharing them with others ever since. If you've struggled with seeking people's approval or any kind of performance mindset in your relationship with Jesus, we believe Sarah's story will speak to you. Well, Sarah, it's wonderful to have you on the podcast and great to see you, and uh, we're grateful for you. Uh, thanks for being willing to share your story today. Will you jump in and tell us a little bit about your growing up years? What were they like, and how did you grow up? Yes, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, good to be here, and uh, yes, I'd love to share that. Uh, so I uh, was born and raised in India, in South India, uh, from a city, Chennai. And uh, I was blessed uh, to be, grow up in a Christian home. My uh, ancestors were, had been Christians for four generations. So we were taught the Bible at home. We had daily prayer. And that was uh, so much a part of our lives. And I was also blessed to go to a Christian school where uh, I learned the word. We learned to memorize scripture and uh, attended a great church, uh, Sunday school, uh, youth group later, and uh, just thankful, so thankful to the Lord for um, the, the roots that I had, you know, growing up. Um, so um, I, I was really blessed that way, and I accepted uh, the Lord when I was, uh, uh, I think even growing up at home, I was, you know, taught about Jesus and how uh, what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. But then when I was in the sixth uh, grade, I accepted the Lord at a scripture union camp. And uh, so that that was pretty significant to me. Mm. So I know, you know, you're only in middle school. You're still pretty young. But even at that point, what was some things that changed in your life? And maybe were there things that didn't change in your life after putting your faith in Jesus? Yeah, thank you, Abby. Great question. Um, so I would uh, say that to have that assurance that uh, Jesus was my savior and uh, God is my father. Uh, I think that probably was the biggest thing for me. Um, I was pretty shy and, uh, you know, kind of uh, an introvert uh, pretty much all my life. Uh, so uh, for me, you know, uh, to know that uh, somebody uh, loved me so much and uh, Jesus personally cared for me, that was huge for me. And things that didn't change were, uh, I, I don't think there was anything that uh, significant that way. Uh, I i was still, you know, when I accepted the Lord, I was not into, 
you know, there wasn't like a huge change. I was, you know, still had a relationship with him, reading his word and all of that. Probably the thing maybe that changed the most was uh, how serious I took my relationship with the Lord. Um, and uh, in my high school years, uh, so uh, I used to love to witness to people and I used to tell people about the Lord. And uh, that probably was the thing that changed. You know, I wanted to share my faith in Christ. Were there ever points where you were worried that maybe I'm not a, a good Christian or I'm not living up to your own or others' expectations? Yeah, I uh, I did have that always, you know, uh, thank God I've uh, had this relationship with the Lord where I'm um, always confident that He loves me uh, no matter what. But there have been times when I kind of, uh, you know, if I messed up in some way, I equated that with uh, whether He loved me or not or whether he was pleased with me. Maybe I should say that. I, I knew that God loved me no matter what, but uh, maybe it was a question of whether uh, I was totally pleasing to him. And so I kind of uh, did what I could to kind of get back, you know, to that place where I didn't feel guilty uh, or um, I didn't feel like I had let down God in some way. So, um, yeah, I, I think that would be it. Hmm. I can resonate with that. I know uh, I really thought and lived that way for a few years and didn't even realize I was doing it. But, you know, after I would sin or mess up or fail my own expectations, I felt like, okay, I need to be nice to my wife and I need to read the Bible for a few days before God really wants to hear from me again. How did that look for you, though? You mentioned, you know, you had to kind of make that up. How did that look for you? Yeah, uh, it put a lot of pressure on me, I would say, um, because uh, in our culture in India, we uh, whatever we did, we had to do it uh, at a really high level. Uh, for example, even education, right? It's, it's so important in India. And so uh, our parents always told us, you, had, you have to be the best student, and uh, which is all good. You know, I tell that to my kids too, to encourage them to be and do their best. Uh, but in some ways, I think that put a lot of pressure on me as to how I needed to perform. Um, and that kind of translated into almost every area of my life, be it having my quiet time or if I uh, did something at church, uh, if I taught a Sunday school class. Uh, if I didn't do as well as I wanted to, I kind of thought there was, you know, something was off. And I, so I put a lot of pressure on myself that way. And uh, I equated my worth to what I did. So uh, I think that was a huge thing for me. And uh, it, it was uh, up until a few years ago. Thanks for sharing that, Sarah. I think many, many people can resonate with that statement that you equated your worth with what you did. I know Dan can, I can too. And Thanks for describing even the culture in India where there's just this high expectation. And even your parents who love the Lord are kind of maybe explicitly or implicitly saying, OK, you need to be the best student. You need to you know, get these good grades and do all the things. And it's very natural for that to translate into your relationship with God and this kind of performance based Christianity. So. What were some of the effects of living a performance-based life like that in, in terms of your faith? I know you mentioned some, but were there any other major effects? Yeah. Uh, so I think the one thing that stands out to me is that I uh, used to seek uh, the approval of people, uh, even if they were just close to me. For example, I uh, have led worship uh, for many years. And so when I got up to lead worship and I, after I was done, instead of just leaving it to the Lord, Lord, I know you, you've you anointed me for this, you've called me to do this, and uh, I've done this by your grace, and thank you, Lord, not leaving it at that, uh, I used to immediately come back to my seat and, you know, look either whether it was my husband or somebody else to see. And my first question was, how did I do? You know, so I, I always had that pressure to check with someone and to, I, I would say it was approval in a way, you know. Um, and I was always, I used to feel good after service if somebody came up to me and said, oh, the time that you led worship was great. So I 
definitely was looking for people's opinion and approval. And uh, uh, when I kind of knew, <laughs> you know, at the back of my head, that's not what I should be doing. But anyway, I looked for it because of that whole performance uh, related pressure that I put on myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know, like Abby said, a lot of people can identify with that, wanting that that approval from others. Did I do an acceptable job? Um, so you end up then getting married, moving to the States here, having uh, three kids, uh, now young adults. Uh, how did the performance-based or acceptance-oriented thinking impact your marriage and parenting? Yeah, so uh, after I moved here and just like you said, you know, had my children and I did work uh, briefly for a few years uh, initially when my kids were young. And I would say again at the job that I worked, uh, again, I held myself up to that standard and, you know, kind of berated myself if I didn't <laughs> uh, meet expectations and whatnot. And uh, so I think on that front, I did put that anxiety on myself. And even as, you know, just being a mom, you know, uh, I've uh, many times, uh, if my kids uh, didn't do as expected or uh, did not follow through with uh, our expectations as parents, I took that personally and uh, I felt that I was not a good mom. So I think uh, that's a huge thing that uh, many mothers face. And uh, then in my life, even in my marriage, uh, I have a loving, supportive husband. Uh, praise the Lord. Um, I'm so thankful to the Lord for David. Uh, but even even our marriage, you know, um, constantly, I think, I, I, don't, I would think more as a mother, uh, as a, you know, the parent-child relationship. That's where I think I felt it the most uh, uh, because my husband was always loving and supportive of me and uh, my goals and what I uh, was doing. So, um, yes, it, it did translate into different uh, spheres of my life. Hmm. Yeah, I know a lot of a lot of parents will be able to identify with that. You know, my my kids performance or their behavior reflects personally on me, you know, and so, um, you know, I, I'll probably talk about that a little bit later, but because I can certainly identify with that as well. But about 10 years ago, then somebody gave you uh, that the daily in Christ devotional, uh, just that daily scripture a few paragraphs of commentary and then a prayer uh, by Neil Anderson. Uh, you and David read it, uh, went on to read a few other books by him. Uh, those biblical truths came to have a profound impact on your life. Thankfully, you know, you had that background knowledge of scripture, the stories, and you were able to, to quickly grasp uh, what was being taught. But how did learning about your true identity in Christ change your understanding of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I, I would say that that's uh, definitely the best thing that's ever happened to me uh, because, uh, you know, knowing who I am in Christ, uh, the position that I have in Christ, that's a, a big thing for us as Christians to remember. You know, um, whatever happens, uh, whatever behavior uh you know, places where we fall short, uh, that that doesn't really affect who we are in Jesus Christ. And that's, we are seated with Him in the heavenlies. And I just love one of the pictures uh, in our Freedom in Christ uh, course book, which is a cartoon of uh, the believers sitting up in the heavenlies with Christ and Satan is down, defeated. And I remind myself of that continually because uh, who I am in Christ that position that I have with Jesus, you know, uh, he's he's never going to push me from <laughs> that spot. That's guaranteed uh, as a child of God, because I'm God's child. I'm accepted by him uh, no matter what. So that is a, a big thing for me. And then again, equating my uh, worth with what I was doing uh, when I came to find out that that's not what it is. I, I that's your, my worth is not in what I was doing. And, uh, even before the foundation of the world, um, I love Ephesians 1, where it says that he chose us, he adopted us as his children. And he, uh, even before we got to perform anything, 
that was a huge eye opener for me. And uh, he set me apart and he chose me to be his child. It was nothing to do with my performance. So the truths of that uh, has made such a huge impact in my life. And I now I'm able to tell that to the people who I work with and uh, even my kids uh, to keep telling them, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, even if you're not able to live up to certain standards and all of that, Jesus loves you anyway. And this is who you are in Christ. Never forget that. And uh, we, we are greatly loved by him. So uh, I think knowing that, uh, the core truths of our identity in Christ has been such a great blessing to me. Mm. I love it that you say that's the best thing that's ever happened to you. And you also mentioned that picture of like Ephesians 2, 6, you know, God gave, made us alive with Christ and seated us in the heavenlies with him. And that picture from the course, Satan is way down below, right? Jesus has been seated far above all rulers and authorities. Ephesians 6 says the bat, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, you know, but it's a spiritual battle. Tell us a little bit more about that. What was that spiritual battle aspect of it? Yeah, uh, I would say that, you know, the thing that I've learned to recognize, uh, a key part of that battle, that spiritual battle, is the the lies of the enemy and what the enemy is constantly trying to tell us, to deceive us. And we learn a lot about that through freedom in Christ. And uh, in my life, thinking back to over all those years, I could see that there were so many times that I believed the lies about uh, who I was in Christ. Um, And uh, that made me feel guilty or lesser than, and uh, I knew I had to do something to, you know, get back in God's uh, good graces and all of that. So uh, learning to recognize the voice of the enemy and then counter that with scripture, uh, that's why it's so key for us as children of God to know that, that, that the battle is in, the, in our minds. It's uh, so often we look at people and circumstances and think uh, that's where the fight is, but it's not. It is in our minds. And if we learn to uh, put a stop to the enemy's uh, accusations or deception uh, coming through lies in, in whatever shape or form, uh, then we, I would say that a huge part of that battle would be won. And that's definitely been the case in my life when I've learned to recognize that and say, no, that's not who I am. Uh, this is who God's word says I am. And I've learned also because if we entertain those lies of the enemy, then it becomes a stronghold. And then it's much more <laughs> uh, difficult to tear down that because once that's taken uh, hold off in our minds, it becomes something big and then uh, it takes longer for that stronghold to be broken. So and now I know I recognize the enemy's tactics and I'm able to put a stop to that and then speak the word over my life. So how did you, you mention too, some of that performance orientation in, in your parenting uh, was impacted then as you, as you learned your identity in Christ, you became more assuring toward your kids. Uh, hey, you know, God loves you. You are accepted uh, through Jesus Christ. I love you. You know, it's not if we mess up, if you don't perform perfectly, it doesn't negate that uh, love or that relationship, right? Is there any other way that it has impacted your parenting or any way that you're comfortable talking about seeing the impact on your kids? Yeah, uh, definitely that's probably be the main thing that's happened, the, where I uh, tell them, you know, that it doesn't matter. Uh, we encourage them as parents to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to them. And we always tell them, you have to be excellent at what you do. And that's what the Lord expects of each of us. And uh, uh, whatever we do it, we have to do it with all our hearts to for the glory of the Lord. And we teach them those principles. At the same time, I tell them, because uh, I, I do see out of my three children, I, I uh, one of my daughters is puts pressure on herself, like so, pretty much the way I did uh, growing up. So I have to tell her that's okay. You know, if you don't end up with an A in this class, it's not the end of the world. You know, we we all make mistakes. We uh, having a B is you know there's nothing wrong with that, right? Especially if you worked hard. And uh, so I. Uh, 
reiterate that with uh, my kids as well. And uh, thank God it's been a help. And then again, uh, speaking the scriptures, confessing the word, that's another uh, big thing that uh, we encourage our children to do. Um, in fact, I uh, I wrote a kind of declaration myself a few years back and I um, asked my son, now I take my son to school every morning and drop him off. And uh, we have, I pray with him. And at the end of it, I ask him to say the declaration. Then after he says that, then I say it. And uh, this was even before I came to know the truths of freedom in Christ. I'm secure, I'm accepted and you know significant because some of those things are of being uh, I'm more than a conqueror I'm a victor I'm an overcomer so I uh, tell that to my children and I ask them to say that to speak that over themselves this is who you are in Christ so uh, uh, however a little uh, I, I believe the word of God uh, is so powerful and that's the best uh, weapon that we have against the enemy against uh, recognizing his lies and schemes. And uh, that that's a way that I am able to encourage my children. Mm, amen. What a blessing it is for them to have a mom and parents who are speaking those truths over them. As someone probably like similar to your daughter, put a lot of pressure on myself growing up. Just I know that that has to speak life into her to hear you um, counter those and remind her of her, her identity. So you mentioned these who I am in Christ statements. Um, and just for all of our listeners to understand, the who I am in Christ statements are a list of about 36 identity truths. They're organized under three sections. I'm accepted, I'm secure, and I'm significant. There's a scripture reference that goes with each one. And they're in the back of the Steps to Freedom in Christ booklet, but they're also on a bookmark that we sell on our on our bookstore. So you mentioned that, Sarah, that these statements really had an impact on your life and that you use them regularly. Will you share with us if there's a few that really have resonated with you or just how you use those in your daily life? Uh, so I would say under the I am accepted section, I am God's child. That's a huge one for me to know that I'm a child of God, first and foremost, that that's my identity and nothing is going to change that. And under I'm secure, uh, I actually love all of these statements, uh, but uh, I'm secure is uh, I have not been given a spirit of fear, uh, but of power, love and of a sound mind. And uh, I know I'm assured that all things work together for good. Uh, that's a, a huge truth for me to always uh, to assure myself that at the end, God will, he will always work everything together for our good. Um, and then and under, I'm significant, I'm the salt and light of the earth. And uh, I uh, have been appointed and chosen to bear fruit. So uh, the, those are some of the ones. Uh, and of course, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. I say that verse a lot, in fact, uh, that, that to give me courage in uh, whatever situation I'm in, to know that uh, with Jesus uh, in me and the Holy Spirit working through my life, I'm able to do all things. Mm, yeah, those are great. And just for our listeners to know too, Sarah actually has her bookmark right next to her. So <laughs> um, I remember memorizing all of those verses and how impactful it was in just renewing my mind. So Sarah, obviously these principles have had a big impact on your life. So much so that just a few years ago, you decided to become a CFMA with our ministry, and that stands for a Community Freedom Ministry Associate, which basically just means that you went through training to become a certified volunteer with Freedom in Christ. And one of the things that you said in uh, reflection, you've said that the more that you teach and you see people grasp these principles of freedom and identity in Christ, the more important you see they are. What makes you say that from what you've seen in other people's lives? Um, definitely, it, you know, how it has made such a huge impact in my life. And uh, my great desire is that uh, I'm able to tell that to people as well to uh, just even these uh, simple I am statements, right? Uh, who we are in Christ, uh, just to, uh, and I, I hand out those bookmarks to many people because I love doing that. And, uh, you know, what better way to have it 
right there with you uh, to read or put it on your fridge and uh, all of that. So just as it has impacted my life greatly, uh, my desire is uh, to tell people about it and to and then when I see them actually to seeing the fruit of, you know, when they go through that course, for example, uh, I just did one of the courses in the fall. I led that course, the Freedom in Christ course. And even today, I hear testimonies from those uh, uh, ladies, how they were blessed and how uh, some of those uh, truths have uh, changed their life. And uh, even a couple of days ago, I was talking to one of them and, and she said, what a blessing it has been in her life. And so it, it's just to see uh, how it's so practical, it's so relevant. So many of us have been raised in the church. We know the word, uh, but yet uh, these truths, even just uh, be it forgiveness or uh, anything else, uh, you know, just recognizing the lies of the enemy. The, these things, even as sometimes as mature Christians, we need to know these truths over and over again and how uh, it applies to our life and, and what changes we need to make the responsibility that we need to take to uh, do those things in our lives. So um, seeing that impacting so many people uh, has been a blessing. So uh, um, absolutely, I, I love sharing that and uh, I will keep continuing to do that in whatever way the Lord shows me how to. Well, uh, you mentioned you were born in India and you didn't move to the States until you were an adult. And I was just curious, so have you been able to take any of these Freedom in Christ resources or materials back to any of your friends or family in India? Uh, yes. So uh, we uh, also have some connection with the Freedom in Christ uh, office in India, and which happens to be in Chennai. So uh, a couple of the ministries that we are involved in Chennai have uh, taken the resources from Freedom in Christ there, and we were able to donate some of uh, the materials uh, so they've taken and used them, which has uh, been a huge blessing. And uh, especially the Steps to Freedom in Christ uh, uh, has been used by uh, one of the ministries that we uh, work with there. Uh, they work with uh, women who have been trafficked and uh, now they are rehabilitating them and they are uh, speaking the word to them. And so they use, uh, it, it is a relative of ours. Uh, she actually is a doctor, a psychiatrist who uses this in her practice and which is wonderful that she's able to use the steps to freedom. And so, uh, yes, we've been able to give some of the resources to a few ministries there. And uh, definitely, you know, as and when we are able to go back to India, we would uh, keep doing that. Wow, that is really, really that's awesome. Encouraging to hear. Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> yeah, no, I love, I love it. I mean, we're we're in forty five countries officially. We're heading into another twenty or so. The international arm of the ministry is working to develop country leaders and and people all around the globe that are helping believers recognize these things. And you know, like you've talked about, I've heard countless stories of you know how it improves marriages, parenting. Uh, makes people bolder witnesses, more fruitful servants uh, in their community and their church. Uh, so it's really exciting to hear, and and what a what a neat thing to hear that your relative, who's a psychiatrist, is using this. Uh, we do have studies that show a forty to sixty percent improvement, increased uh, mental and emotional health following our process of of learning these truths and then going through the steps to freedom. That prayer process that connects us with the Lord. How did you see the steps? Uh, impact your own life? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking that. Because uh, for me, I would say I've been through the steps uh, at least uh, three or four times now. And uh, uh, the first time that I did it, uh, interestingly, it was when I went back to school and I did my master's. The first course that I did was spiritual formation. And uh, they had the steps to freedom as integrated in, in that. And uh, we had to kind of take ourselves through it so uh, I didn't know much about it then. So I just did it because I had to do it <laughs> to fulfill that requirement. But I, I did find it uh, interesting. And I was like, wow, OK, uh, I've never done something like this before. So that was kind of a first, uh, you know, uh, an introduction uh, to me uh, the first time I did it. And uh, just knowing that, OK, these are areas in my life where I have potentially 
given the devil a foothold and I need to confess this, I need to renounce this. And uh, yes, and I, I, I did take it uh, seriously. Uh, but um, uh, later on, when I did my, uh, you know, went to CFMU and became a CFMA, I, at my practicum in uh, New York, uh, that's where I think that that's probably be, was the best experience that I had with the steps where we, as part of our training, we had to lead somebody else through it, uh, another trainee. And we also had a leader in the ministry who was uh, coaching us uh, as to how to do the steps. And uh, that was huge for me because uh, I don't know what happened, but <laughs> I could only say it was the Holy Spirit working that uh, I we went into one of the steps and I just started to cry and I just couldn't stop. I was so overwhelmed and uh, I, I just kept saying, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> you know, or oh, what's happening here. But uh, the, but uh, they were so gracious to say, okay, we've seen this happen. Just let the Lord do His work. And it touched me in such a wonderful way that um, uh, something back in my childhood where I was taken to and uh, and the Lord brought uh, extraordinary healing that day. And I think about that uh, so often because it's changed my life so much. Uh, and I've been able to uh, look past that. And, and the great thing about the steps is I tell people that now when I take them through it. I say, uh, listen, there might be some things that you might know uh, you need resolution for, but there are many things that you don't even have a clue about and suddenly the Holy Spirit would just touch and he would break open that gate and that healing process would begin. And uh, so I kind of give them a heads up because I didn't have that happen to me. But uh, in any case, that was such a beautiful experience uh, when it happened to me. And um, and we are told in the ministry that we have to take ourselves through the steps at least once a year, which I think is uh, absolutely necessary. And even other times, uh, maybe not the whole process, but one or two steps where we need uh, certain things uh, resolved. It's good as a practice on an ongoing basis, and I've been able to do that. And I see it so, as it's so powerfully worked in my life, I see it working in uh, the people's lives that are, whom I take them through. And uh, it's been a huge, huge, it's made a huge impact in my life. And I'm so grateful to the Lord for that. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Sarah, again, thank you so much for being willing to share your story. Um, I think it's funny that even you mentioned right at the beginning, you're an introvert, you know, <laughs> <Yes>. and yet, <laughs> you, you know, here you are free in Christ, being willing to share your story with many. So thank you so much. We pray that the Lord uses this to encourage many believers in their walk with God too. So thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Dan and Abby, for this great opportunity to share my story. And I uh, trust and pray that the Lord would use it for His glory. Amen. Thank you. So on this podcast, we talk a lot about different Freedom in Christ materials. Books, devotionals, courses, training. It's kind of a lot. You might be thinking to yourself, I'd love to get more of a taste of what Freedom in Christ teaches, but I'm not really sure where to start. Well, if that's you, I'd really recommend starting with the Freedom in Christ course. It's our basic discipleship course designed to help you break free from what is holding you back and become who you are made to be in Christ. And it truly is for every Christian, whether you've been one for a long time or you're a brand new follower of Jesus. Unlike many discipleship courses today, the focus of the Freedom in Christ course is not on how to behave, but on what to believe. It tackles issues that so many of us deal with, like breaking free from ongoing sin patterns, handling negative emotions, and learning what it means to have a new identity in Christ. The teaching is video-based, biblical, and practical. So if you're interested, you can go through the Freedom in Christ course online in a guided small group setting this fall. Registration is now open and classes start the week of September 6th. All you have to do is buy your materials. To see class options and to sign up, go to ficm.org slash courses or click on the link in the show notes. Well, Abby, what a great uh, interview to hear from Sarah, something that so many of us in the world really, but I know too in the U.S. here in Western culture, 
struggle with that idea of performance-based acceptance, right? People will like me if I measure up. Some people, of course, rebel against that, and they're like, I'm purposefully not going to try to measure up. But others, they'll try and uh, achieve high standards so that other people like them. You know, it was interesting, like you were saying, to hear her say, uh, you know, after she would lead worship, uh, she would ask her husband, how did I do, right? A lot of times people, uh, when we're in that performance-based acceptance, we look to others to see, did I measure up? You know, am I doing good enough? I know for me, I, I held high standards for myself. You know, I grew up in a family where my dad has his PhD in chemistry, and chemistry was my worst subject, you know, so I didn't measure up there. But also then I remember, and my mom would probably be horrified if she uh, knew this impacted me this way, because I'm sure she didn't mean it. But, you know, my older brother was three years ahead of me. And when his IQ score came home in elementary school, you know, there was great rejoicing because he got a pretty high IQ score. And then three years later, when my IQ score came home in an envelope and mom opened it and read what that score was, and I was excited to hear what that score was, she said, let's not talk about that. Mm. <laughs> you know? And so in my young mind, all of a sudden, what do I think about myself? Well, I must not be smart. But then the lie over the years becomes, A, I'm not smart enough to do X, Y, or Z. Or B, I have to then find a way to achieve, to perform, to be accepted, to live significantly through some other avenue uh, than by academic achievement. Wow. And your mom, like you mentioned, she probably didn't even realize that effect it does make me think of in my story too, just that approval, that fear of man. And I really loved when Sarah did share that story about she would lead worship, she would come sit back down and she would kind of look to her husband or look to someone around her for that affirmation. But what I really loved is that she said, in the back of my mind, I knew that was wrong. Like I knew it was wrong to look to them for my approval, but I didn't really know what to do with it. And I think that was similar for me. I knew it was wrong that I was seeking approval from other people and from their perception of me. And I could tell, you know, how my emotions would go up and down, almost like a seesaw and how unstable that could be. But yet I didn't really know how to counter that, even if I, in my head, knew I was loved by God and significant. I think a big part of it was actually those identity truths, the who I am in Christ statements that Sarah mentioned and that we talked about. And she mentioned that bookmark. I had one of those bookmarks and I ended up memorizing each of those verses and reciting them every morning for, I think it was almost two years. And how just that practice really, really renewed and kind of changed my mindset about myself and even gave me more security and confidence in my identity and not having to look for that from other people. Yeah. And so, you know, you talk about that truth versus deception battle, right? That we believe lies. We believe things that are not true about us based on, again, things that especially our parents, they want the best for us. They don't mean anything by it. I mean, you know, it, again, like I said, my mom would be horrified that to know that that impacted me in that way. But we have to recognize we do have an enemy. He's a tempter, right? And usually when we're tempted, we know it. He's the accuser of the brethren, Revelation twelve ten says, uh, right? So he tempts us and then he accuses us, but he's the deceiver of the whole world. Well, in John, uh, the Gospel of John, he says in chapter 7, 28, Jesus said, he who sent me is true, right? So the Father, the one who sent Jesus, is true. He says then in chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then in chapter 14, verse 16, as well as in 16, 13, he says, the Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. 
right? And then in John 17, verse 17, when he's praying for those who will believe because of the testimony of the apostles, he says, sanctify them by your word, your word is truth. So you have the Father, Son, and Spirit, and his word, the scriptures, or what we know as the Bible, are truth. Part of what I love about that is truth is not a list of rules that we follow. Truth is a person himself, right? God himself is truth. And so Jesus also said in chapter 8 of the Gospel of John, he talked about this difference. And he said in chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, and abiding doesn't mean just intellectually knowing, but it means, am I resting in it? Am I living from that place? Am I walking it out? If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Twelve verses later, he says this about the devil. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Five times in one verse, he calls Satan a liar. And he says about himself, I, my father, and the spirit, and our word is truth, and Satan is a liar. And you and I are in that battle between truth versus deception. So we have to recognize deception by knowing the truth. Amen. Mic drop. (laughs) That was awesome. I really like how you (laughs) went through Father, Son, Spirit, Word, Truth, Satan. That was incredible. So with that, we will bid you adieu and we will see you next time. Bye. And remember, Jesus also said, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. The one who's the truth can set you free. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of Stories of Freedom. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And help us get the word out by sharing Stories of Freedom with your family and friends. To learn more about freedom in Christ, visit FICM.org or follow us on social media by searching Freedom in Christ USA. The links are in the show notes.